Good morning, everybody. And speaking of morning, it's 3.30 in the morning in Denver, uh, <laughs> where I live. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this conference. Uh, as you can see, the title of my talk is Plagiarism is Everywhere, Detecting and Reporting Plagiarism in Predatory Journals and Other Publications. I believe that predatory publishers have contributed to an increase in the occurrence of published plagiarism. In fact, it's pretty much uh, routine in some online journals now, and researchers are exposed to and victimized uh, by plagiarism and plagiarists now more than ever before in history. So here are the main points, my thesis statements, which I want to get across today. First, I find that generally, plagiarism is only an issue when the person doing it is an enemy or something you don't like. On the other hand, if your hero, friend, or colleague plagiarizes, then plagiarism is not really so bad. There are few incentives to reporting plagiarism. In fact, unfortunately, reporting plagiarism involves much risk and typically punishes the reporter more than the plagiarist. For plagiarists, predatory journals are a godsend, and they have enabled many unscrupulous researchers the opportunity to publish in academic journals and earn academic credit at their universities and expand their CVs with publications for which they don't deserve credit. In short, many researchers have been granted promotions and tenure and even employment by plagiarizing earlier articles in predatory journals. So uh, here's a review of predatory publishers. They are open access publishers or journals that unprofessionally exploit the gold author pays open access model for their own profit. They use deception, they are often not transparent, and they don't follow scholarly publishing industry standards. You know one when you see one, and in most cases, I found that there is little disagreement in classifying a journal as predatory. They are obvious. One weakness of the author pays uh, scholarly publishing model is the conflict of interest it creates. The more papers a journal accepts and publishes, the more money it makes. This means the temptation is always present for journals to accept unscientific otherwise unworthy papers so they can earn the income from the author. Unfortunately, many evaluation systems look only at the number of publications and they don't examine the quality of the journal or of the published papers. This has led to the profusion of predatory journals. Vetting a list of publications takes time, for you have to examine each journal on the list to see if it is a legitimate journal or not. And many predatory journals intentionally create titles that closely match those of respected journals. And finally, some scholarly authors needing to increase their publication count will use the easy acceptance that predatory journals provide. Now, description with a couple examples. First, let's have a look at the website. Sorry, the slides are out of order. Uh, here's an example. The Open Journal for Blood Cancer, a title which is ungrammatical in English, uh, from the horrible, spamming, uh, relatively new publisher called Gavin Publishers. This publisher claims to be based in the US state of Illinois uh, with a branch office in Australia, but I strongly doubt and, and think it's really likely based in Asia somewhere. It publishes 78 predatory medical journals. Predatory publishers know that medical researchers are more likely to have grants, funds they can use to pay the publishing fees, so they focus their efforts on in the biomedical sciences. Gavin Publishers is an aggressive operation that is damaging to science, damaging to researchers, and damaging to scholarly publishing. And there are hundreds of other publishers like it. So here's another example. Uh, this is the website of the International Journal of Advanced Research in Science, Engineering, and Technology. That journal has a very broad scope, which enables it to accept uh, articles from pretty much any field related to science or engineering or technology. And I would not be surprised if the journal would accept uh, uh, 
a humanities article just to earn uh, money from the author. It prominently displays its ISSN because unfortunately, some still think that any journal with this persistent identifier is approved by a government. In addition, the journal prominently displays uh, in the bottom on the right there in the yellow, a fake impact factor on its main page and the current value of this metric is 4.346. I've been following this journal for some time and have observed that its fake impact factor regularly increases. Fake metrics always go up, they never go down. The impact factor is as fake as any metric can be. Now here's another screenshot from the journal's homepage and I've enlarged it to make it easier to see. Uh, the journal's call for papers for this month's issue says you have until tomorrow, May 25th, to submit your paper. The fake peer review process will only take five days, and I guarantee your paper will be accepted. No revisions will be necessary, and your paper will be published uh, in the journal on Tuesday, May 30th, which is next Tuesday. Uh, never before in the history of scholarly publishing has it been so fast or so easy to publish in an academic journal. Predatory journals have given rise to the great irony of articles about plagiarism that themselves contain plagiarism, and as this one apparently does. It's an article with the ungrammatical title, Plagiarism, a Serious Scientific Misconduct. It was published in a predatory journal called the International Journal of Health Sciences and Research. I wrote a blog post about this article on my now dead blog, and I documented that some of the sentences in the article are lifted word for word from previously published articles about plagiarism in legitimate journals. Uh, the article has not been retracted. Some people cite cultural differences as the reason that so much plagiarism occurs in South Asia where this is published. Um, I think the definition of plagiarism is pretty easy to learn and understand. Uh, the concepts are not difficult. And if a researcher can understand complex scientific topics such as photosynthesis and electromagnetic radiation, then he or she can just as easily understand what constitutes plagiarism and learn to avoid it. A screenshot of one of the web pages that belongs to the India-based journal entitled International Journal of Science and Research. This is a completely predatory journal that all honest researchers should avoid. It claims it has an imp impact factors assigned by ResearchGate and by a fake impact factor company. The publisher charges $60 to publish an article in, in this corrupt journal. The journal publishes so much unoriginal, plagiarized, copyright violating material that it has this report copyright infringement page to make it easier for people to report copyright violations to the journal. The text on the page says in broken English, quote, contact IJSR to report copyright infringement. Stolen article from IJSR index if your report is verified and proven to be true. Uh, this is an area where copyright and plagiarism overlap. I've seen other open access journals that have similar pages where one can report plagiarism. It's clear they are not checking for plagiarism before the articles are published, and this is because they want to get the money from the authors even if they have to remove the paper later and they don't refund the money. Sometimes the threat of a copyright violation action is the only way to deal with plagiarism. For authors who retain copyright on their articles and release them under a Creative Commons license, the only person who has an interest in defending the copyright when needed is the author himself. On the other hand, those researchers publishing in respected and well-managed subscription journals, uh, after transferring their copyright to the publisher, they will find that the publisher itself will take, take action to protect its copyrights from disreputable open access journals such as this one. Here's a screenshot of the first page of an article I co-authored with Dr. Mark Fox in 2014. It was published in a journal called Ethics and Behavior. Some of the advice this article uh, gives includes, one, always make uh, and save backup copies of uh, plagiarized work. 
Be very careful in the language that you use. Don't directly accuse anyone of plagiarism. Use terminology such as, quote, the text in this article matches the text in this previously published article, and no quotation marks are used and no citation is given. Three, uh, be sure what constitutes plagiarism. For example, copying in the methods section of a scientific article may not be considered plagiarism. And four, don't rely on plagiarism detection software to determine plagiarism when presenting evidence or accusations of plagiarism. Unfortunately, even if you follow all of the advice we gave in this article, it is still possible you will be sued in court, and that's exactly what happened to my co-author, Dr. Fox, and I will describe uh, this horrible story in a few minutes. I had in reporting plagiarism, I took the lead in exposing this apparent plagiarism, and my friend and doctor a friend and colleague, Dr. Fox, assisted me. In February 2013, I wrote a blog post about some apparent plagiarism in the Journal of Academic and Business Ethics, one of 19 journals published by the Jacksonville, Florida-based Academic and Business Research Institute, AABRI. This so-called institute appears to be uh, chiefly a one-man operation headed by entrepreneur Dr. Russell K. Baker, who's an associate professor of management institute uh, information systems at the Davis College of Business at Jacksonville University in Florida. The case was made more interesting by the fact that the apparent piracy occurred in a business ethics journal. After my blog post was published, the article disappeared with no retraction statement, and this is a typical response to uh, piracy published in predatory journals when it draws attention. The person who was listed as the article's author is the man pictured on this slide. Uh, Towson, or Towson is the name of the university he worked at until his name silently disappeared from the list of faculty in the accounting department at the university about a year after we reported the apparent piracy. We searched other articles listed on his Vita and found similar occurrences uh, from earlier publications appearing in the author's new articles, and some of these were published in journals from the Clute Institute, another uh, institute, uh, publisher on my list that's uh, actually based in Denver, where I live. So I have quoted here the most significant portions of the articles uh, that appeared in a report in the Baltimore Sun newspaper after we tipped the newspaper off to the unoriginal text in the professor's articles. One thing that made the story newsworthy was the fact that the professor was the chair of the ethics committee for the Baltimore School District. Quote, a longtime Towson professor has resigned his post as the head of the city's school systems ethics panel amid allegations that his published academic articles contain content from dozens of sources without proper or in some cases any attribution. Quote, I don't think I've done anything wrong, said Neil, 62. The issue seems to be that I didn't put things in quotes, but I've given attribution to people, end quote. We observed entire paragraphs that, were, that copied exactly the text from paragraphs in earlier published articles. Some of these paragraphs had citations at the end, but no quotation marks. The newspaper report continued, quote, May, Neil's attorney, described the professor as, quote, an honest ethical guy. He said there was no universally accepted definition of plagiarism and that, quote, attempting to pin this down is like catching smoke in a butterfly net. Quote, he pointed to the fact that Neil included citations and a bibliography in some of his work as proof and that he did not intend to deceive. He said that at least one of Neil's papers that had been withdrawn by its publisher has been republished after formatting changes, end quote. So when confronted with plagiarism accusations, this is what uh, people do. They or their lawyers trade on the ambiguity of the definition of plagiarism. They create doubt about whether the copied material actually rises to meet the definition of plagiarism, and often this doubt uh, is enough for university committees to rule in favor of the plagiarist 
finding him innocent uh, of any charges. So now I want to tell you about my friend Dr. Mark Fox and the horrible experience he had because he tried to help clear up the scholarly record from apparent plagiarism. Mark is a business professor at Indiana University South Bend in the US state of Indiana. Here is what some of a university newspaper said at the time, which was July 2014. Quote, Peter Agamen, an Indiana University South Bend professor, has filed a lawsuit against a colleague for defamation of character in the workplace. After Dr. Fox shared his unattributed copying observations with his colleagues at the university, the university conducted an investigation and found that the professor had not committed plagiarism. Uh, end quote. I think it's common for university committees to conclude that no plagiarism took place even when the evidence is strong that it did take place. And there are many reasons for this, including university politics and the ability of lawyers to inject doubt into accusations such as the smoke in a butterfly net defense we already heard about. In addition, when it's your friend or colleague that is accused of plagiarism, then the plagiarism is sometimes not so bad, and the tendency is to treat the plagiarism accusations magnanimously. The accounting professor sued his colleague, Mark Fox, for spreading false reports of alleged plagiarism of research papers. Fox's complaint to the university about plagiarism allegations triggered the internal investigation. School spokesman Ken Byrell said that the investigation proved Agamemnon's innocence. Fox continues to assert that Agamemnon did plagiarize a paper he co-wrote. Uh, co Re responding to the lawsuit, Fox said, I'm comfortable that I have not made any comments that could be regarded as defamatory against Dr. Agamemnon. I have simply pointed out that wording in research Dr. Agamemnon in research by Dr. Agamemnon is the same as wording used by others, the South Bend Tribune reports, end quote. So my friend had to hire a lawyer at great expense. Uh, there were two trials, a regular trial, which my friend won, and then an appeal. The opposition lawyer worked on commission, so the person suing my friend had nothing to lose. His lawyer would be paid a portion of the settlement uh, if he won. So ultimately, my friend won his appeal, as you can see in this screenshot from a news report from a television station. But the process cost him two and one half years and many thousands of dollars. The news report says, quote, the courts found that such criticism was not falsely or recklessly made and that such communication was important and necessary to address matters of public concern. It continues, in a written statement provided to News Center 16, Fox wrote, quote, I have spent the best part of the last five years dealing with the Indiana University research integrity process and with the Agamemnon's meritless lawsuit. I am thankful to finally be vindicated by the courts and gratified by the support I have received from my colleagues. I wish that I had received more support from IU and its research integrity office and I hope IU provides more support to those raising valid claims of plagiarism in the future. Otherwise, those having good faith claims of plagiarism may remain silent, which would be harmful to institutions of higher learning like Indiana University. So reporting plagiarism can be risky and expensive. It may not be worth it. But even if you win, you can really lose. So moving on, uh, here's a tool that some plagiarists use. Uh, I realize many of you may al already be familiar with, with this, and it's called article spinning. It was originally developed as a way to cheat on search engine optimization, but plagiarists soon figured out uh, it could be a way to automate patch writing, a form of plagiarism. It works by substituting synonyms in text to defeat plagiarism detection software. However, because synonyms are not always perfect semantic matches, the results are sometimes ridiculous, and here's one example. The top paragraph is the original. It says, for normal data, the sample mean and variance are the unbiased estimators of location of the underlying 
In the lower paragraph, in another article, this sentence is then spun so as to read, for Gaussian data, the example nasty and alteration are the unbiased estimators of location of the Gaussian distribution. The spun sentence and the ones that follow it make little sense in English. To make this even more absurd, and the copied one were both published uh, in predatory journals. This is the title page of the spun article that contained the, the spun text. Uh, as you can see, the title is probably also run through the spinning software, and, and it makes no sense. It is, Study Heftiness in the Astrophysical Turbulence of Pakistan Airspace. There are six co-authors, all from the University of Karachi. Note that the journal it was published in is called European Academic Research, and it's published in Bucharest, Romania. The editor, and I think the publisher, is Dr. Ekaterina Petrascu, who may still publish several other similar rubbish journals. This journal charges authors $30 per article. The person who originally reported this to me told me that one of the authors successfully used the article for the publishing credit he needed to earn his PhD at the University of Karachi. One of the things I observed regularly during my time of listing predatory publishers and journals was what I came to call template plagiarism, though I'm sure I'm not the first to use this term. I wrote several blog posts about it. Often people would email me and report misconduct in scholarly publishing, and this made me realize that we really need a central place to report such uh, unethical academic behavior, yet there still really is none. Yes, you can report misconduct to editors, but unless you are able to force the issue uh, using bad publicity, they generally ignore such reports, lest it become clear what a bad job they're doing as editors. I know we also have pub peer, but I don't think it's really taken off as a place for reporting plagiarism. Anyway, here's an example of template plagiarism that I blogged about. The top article is just a normal research article as far as I know and does not show any evidence of misconduct. It appears in Biomed Central's Diagnostic Pathology. The article on the bottom used the template plagiarism technique quickly drafting a new article using the structure of the first. The four authors, all from Iran, uh, one of the world capitals of template plagiarism, also submitted their article to Diagnostic Pathology, where it was quickly accepted and published after they paid the author fee. I think that the editor in chief of this journal was asleep on the job and the word got out. When a journal suddenly becomes unselective, accepting most everything that is submitted to it, word quickly leaks out and authors needing publishing credit find out. I also think that people who are good at misconduct such as uh, template plagiarism or article spinning actually sell uh, co-authorship on their bogus scholarly papers to others. Alternatively, they sometimes give away co-authorship as a gift, as gift authorship to people, such as their department chair, dean, or some other university official uh, in exchange for favors. So the template plagiarism is easily spotted in the article's conclusion, as you see on the slide. And again, the first article is not known to have any misconduct, it's just a regular article. The article on the bottom uh, is the one that used the template plagiarism technique. <clears throat> a diagnostic pathology, the journal that accepted and published the corrupt article, uh, currently has an impact factor, a legitimate one, of 1.895. So getting an article published in this journal can score big academic victories for the co-authors, especially in Iran, which has a large population and relatively few opportunities for advancement compared to other countries. How many people have gotten promotions at universities by using plagiarism? So after I published my blog post, Biomed Central uh, conducted an investigation to their credit and confirmed the misconduct. Then they retracted the article, as you can see. Uh, when this appeared, I remember receiving a mean email from Iran. 
Again, there really needs to be a central place and process for reporting plagiarism and other scholarly publishing misconduct. As I mentioned, I regularly received reports from around the world, uh, reports of misconduct like this, and the one and the people making the reports had no official method for exposing or reporting the misconduct. They always asked me to keep them anonymous, a request I respected, because if they were found out, it could very negatively affect their careers at their universities. And very often it was junior researchers reporting the misconduct of senior researchers in the same academic department. At the beginning of my talk today, I said that one of my main points was, if your hero plagiarizes, then plagiarism is not really so bad, and I'd like to give a cogent example of that. You're no doubt familiar with the American civil rights hero, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's a Nobel laureate and was awarded dozens of honorary degrees, and his birthday is a national holiday in the United States. You may not know, however, that he was a serial plagiarist, and much documentation exists to support this from his college days to his last days. He plagiarized at his undergraduate college and much of his doctoral dissertation that he presented at Boston University where he was a PhD student in theology was copied from a student who graduated several years earlier. He even plagiarized his famous I have a dream speech according to sources. Few Americans know about this plagiarism. It has successfully been kept quiet, and if you ask people at universities across the US, perhaps even professors of history, they will likely tell you that they have never heard of the plagiarism accusations against Dr. King, and others will tell you that you're inventing the story. The book Plagiarism in the Culture War documents and analyzes King's plagiarism. Uh, it took the author Theodore Pappas years to find a publisher willing to accept and publish uh, his manuscript. There's an article about in the English Wikipedia, and apparently this is the only language Wikipedia that has such an article, so probably even fewer outside the United States know of King's plagiarism. The article's title, Martin Luther King Jr. Authorship Issues, uses a euphemism for plagiarism in its title. Uh, fortunately for him, Dr. King was not a German politician would have been more closely scrutinized. There's no Vrani Plague wiki for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a plagiarist. This is the first of two examples of King's plagiarism I'd like to show. The example is copied from, photocopied from the book Plagiarism in the Culture War, and it document, documents one instance of King's plagiarism from his university days, or actually his college as he attended a college. His wife donated most of his uh, papers to Stanford University in the mid-1980s, and the archive is called the Martin Luther King Papers Project. And here's the second example, and it's from King's dissertation at Stanford University. It was not retracted. Even of the plagiarism contains became known to university officials. Again, I photocopied this from Papa's book. King copied text from a dissertation that was written about three years uh, before his was, also at Boston University. Okay, so in my uh, couple of remaining slides, I'd like to share some additional kind of random information that further supports my main points. First, I believe that lots of student plagiarism occurs, occurs in online classes and in some MOOCs, and this is in addition to all the MOOCs themselves that contain copyrighted content that does not meet the fair use or fa fair dealing guidelines, and for which no permission was grant, uh, given to reproduce the content. In the United States, universities are increasingly organizing themselves and acting like for-profit companies. They are always looking for ways to increase their revenue and expand the products and services they offer, just like a business does. At the same time, the American government guarantees student loans, so banks lending money to students never have to worry about students repaying their loans. 
the result has been that universities keep raising their tuition and the students just borrow more and the cycle repeats. Because there is so much money to be made, now many universities offer online classes and degrees and other distance learning opportunities. You can live in California and attend a university in New Hampshire without ever visiting the campus. And there is much competition among the universities. They all want that student loan money. But this increase in online education has led to an increase in plagiarism, I believe. Some universities screen online student work using plagiarism checking software, um, but this is easily defeated. Moreover, in North America, these products are very expensive and not all schools are able to, avoid, to afford their services. I want to tell you about a new product called ICRI. Uh, if you look at its website, you won't see any mention of plagiarism checking, but it does offer this service and it does it in a completely different way than any service currently on the market. According to one of the firm's principals, Jamie Haidt, quote, the existential problem is that the paper mill sites, EduBirdy, Paper Coach, et cetera, offer students original work, usually written by graduate students, that comes with a 100% guarantee to beat Turnitin and others. If a student is faced with paying $50, or working hard for two weeks, what is he or she going to do? Our approach is to focus on who claims to have written the paper, not what is in the paper. We compute a unique writing signature for each student. By the third submission, we can measure student writing against this known signature and throw up a flag if there is suspicious variation in language." End quote. So this service creates a repository of each student writing and then compares it to later writing to see if it matches the student's writing style. In this way, it can detect plagiarism using artificial intelligence. This is uh, still a startup company, but I think it has a lot of potential. As I mentioned, there's overlap between plagiarism and copyright. When someone plagiarizes copyrighted material, it's both plagiarism and a violation of intellectual property rights. Now there are some academic librarians in the United States who are taking an activist approach towards copyright in particular and intellectual property rights in general. We may be witnessing the beginnings of a new social movement similar to the open access movement. One of the things they are saying Oh, sorry, one of the things they are doing is chattering a lot about fair use or fair dealing and promoting it as an almost universal exception to copyright law. Although they don't come out and say every use is a fair use, that seems to be the message that they are promoting. Some academic librarians in North America are using the term big content in a negative way to stigmatize publishers and distributors of proprietary scholarly content. This is further evidence that they are trying to start a new social movement, and it parallels the terminology used to stigmatize other legitimate industries, such as big pharma for the pharmaceutical industry and big oil for the petroleum industry. So refusing to respect copyright may be part of the next social movement to infect higher education, and I think this will have a spillover effect on attitudes towards plagiarism. It may work, unfortunately, to decrease the stigma attached to academic plagiarism. So I regret that I have to paint such a dark picture of current reality of plagiarism and copyright and integrity in higher education, um, but that's how I see the current state of affairs. Predatory journals are full they are happy to take money to publish it. But plagiarism's severity depends on the relationship between the person committing the plagiarism and the person judging it. If you are a friend or admirer of the plagiarist, the plagiarism may not be so bad, but if the plagiarist is an enemy, then the plagiarism threatens uh, civilization and the progress of science. <laughs> Reporting plagiarism has become too risky. We need an effect or service where people can report plagiarism anonymously without risk, 
a service that also protects authors from false accusations. I am observing in North America that respect for copyright and other intellectual property is uh, decreasing, and this may be the beginning of a librarian-led social movement against intellectual property rights that may, in turn, decrease the stigma associated with plagiarism. Again, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today.